In the beginning, God. Before there was, there was God. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then, God spoke. At his command, light emerged from the darkness. The light he called day, and the darkness he called night. Then God separated the water from water, creating a vault he called sky. The waters under the sky were gathered to one place, and dry ground appeared. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. From the land arose vegetation, plants and trees, and every green thing bearing fruit, each according to their kinds. Then God placed lights in the vault of the sky to give light to earth, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also created the stars, calling them all out by name. The sun, moon, and stars shone brightly, reflecting the brilliance of the Lord. God filled the seas with every great creature with which the water teems, and God placed every winged bird in the sky above. Then God created the creatures of the land, livestock, wild animals, and all creatures that move along the ground, each according to its kind. God saw all that he had made, the heavens and the earth, the lights of the sky, the crop of the land, and every living thing beneath the waters and above. And it was good. But one thing was missing, God's most beloved creation. So God created man in his own image, raising him up from the dust of the earth. But it was not good for man to be alone. So God created woman from the flesh of man. He breathed his spirit into humanity and together they reflected the image of God. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and rule it. God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. In the beginning, nothing. Until an artist began to paint the sky. Until an engineer drew up plans. Until, until a horticulturist came along and began to grow plants and a zoologist began to come along and to raise animals until a musician gave creation its voice and its song. And until a parent came along and birthed children, creating the first children, giving life and breath to the first humans. But this isn't the only creation story that's out there. If you've been through history class, if you've been through, uh, if, you, if you watch the History Channel, you know this isn't the only creation story that comes even from the ancient Near East. The most popular of them being the Enuma Elish, which was a story about multiple gods who, were get, who, who didn't get along very well and who were fighting about all the work that they had to do and gods looking at each other and saying, I'm doing too much work, you should have to do more. And you know, kind of like children many times bickering back and forth over the amount of work that they had to do until they finally went to daddy god Marduk and said, you've got to fix this. You've got to make it so that we don't have so much work to do all the time. And the god Marduk in all of his wisdom spoke these words. He said, I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. Do you see the contrast between the two creation stories? I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. Translation, I'm going to create some slave labor for us so that we don't have to do all of this work anymore. And so Marduk in the Enuma Elish creation story from the ancient Babylon created man and woman to come along and to do all the work to tend to the land, to do the stuff that the gods didn't want to do anymore. And this was a common theme amongst the creation stories of the day, that man was not created to be with the gods. Man was created to serve the gods and to do what the gods wanted them to do. 
Or we can fast forward a little bit, and we can look at the creation stories of today, most well-known being the Big Bang Theory, that out of nothing came something, and it was suddenly there, but with no real purpose. That man is just kind of here. That we are just walking along until the day that we no longer walk along. That we are simply molecules and atoms and all those other scientific terms that I didn't learn very well when I was in science class. And that's all we are. No purpose to it. You live, you die, you cease to be. But then we open this back up. And we go to Genesis. And if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 1, it's the very first page of your Bible once you get past the concordance and the copyright page and all of those different types of things. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And if you want to put your finger there, you won't have to turn your page for the rest of the morning. In Genesis 1, 26, God has created God the artist, God the engineer, God the horticulturist, God the zoologist, God the musician, God the parent has created. And in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. We're going to pause right there this morning. Because we miss so much of the gospel when we don't go back to the very beginning and when we don't see what the purpose was when this all began in the first place. We miss, as we talk about chasing purpose and and what is the point in our work that we do, we miss so much of it if we don't go back to the very beginning and where it all started in the first place. That God says, let us make mankind in our image. Now let's step back into the Hebrew world just a little bit here for just a moment, and I'm going to teach you a little bit of Hebrew this morning. So this word image that we run across is selem in Hebrew. Say that with me, selem. One more time, selem. It means idol or statue. Now it's got some other meanings that go with it, but the one that we're looking at this morning in particular, because that's what this word translates into in this usage of it, means an idol or a statue, and you might be sitting there and you're thinking, wait a second, but God said not to have idols and statues. Exactly. So let's look at what this means in our context, in the context of Genesis chapter 1. An idol or a statue is simply a visible representation of an invisible being. If you go back to Exodus chapter 32 and verse 4, You probably know the story. If you don't, I'm going to fill you in real fast. The Israelites have been freed from Egypt. They're walking through the desert. They don't know what's coming next. Moses has gone up on a mountain. He's been up there for a really long time. They're pretty sure he's hearing from God, but they're beginning to wonder what happened to him because he's been there so long that they're afraid he's dead, and they need to have someone or something to follow and to worship because whether we like to admit it or not, Mankind looks for something to worship. We were created to worship. And so they look at Aaron and they say, Aaron, make us something. Make us something that we can worship. Now we won't go, we won't go too far into the irony of them asking a human being like them to make something for them to worship. But they say, Aaron, make us something. And so in Exodus 32, In verse 4, we see that Aaron has asked them, give me all of your gold, give me your jewelry, and I'm going to melt it all down. He melts it down, and they make a calf out of it. And he looks at them, and he says, these are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. These are your gods. This calf sitting here is a visible representation of an invisible God that brought you out of Egypt. This calf is an image of of the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Remember, they were living in a time, they were living in an area where multiple gods was the norm. And so for them to to grasp the understanding that no, there is only one God with a capital G. There is no Marduk and all of the other gods that were going to him and complaining about all the work that they had to do. There is one God. They hadn't grasped this yet. So Aaron makes them this image, and they worship the image. And and likely you know the rest of the story. Moses comes down. He sees it. He's not happy. God's not happy. They melt it down. The, The part of it that we tend to skip over is he melts it down. He makes them drink it. Like not like 
straight up, but he puts it, the dust in there. And all. It's, it's, it, there's some weird stuff when you start reading through there. And there's all sorts of imagery there, too, that we won't get into this morning. But God comes along in this world full of these multiple gods that are being worshipped, these, these multiple false gods. They have idols all over that are being worshipped in their image of these invisible gods. And in this story we read that God says, let us make mankind in our image. See, God came along and he said, no, no images made of stone. No images made of wood. No images made of gold. I don't want you going around trying to recreate what I look like because I've already created my image bearer. I've already created my representative of an invisible God. I created you. You are my image bearer. You are my representative. You are my salem. So don't, don't you go on and create other things. You are my image bearer. Take a moment and just, I know you've heard it. I've preached on it. You've probably heard other pastors preach on it. Even if you haven't spent a lot of time in church, you've probably heard this story at some time or another. And it's so easy to skip over it because we've heard it so many times. Because we want to skip ahead to the part of the story where humans are just a bunch of messed up creatures and Jesus came along and saved us. Which is the crux of the gospel story, don't get me wrong, but the gospel story starts right here in Genesis chapter 1. Where he says, you are my image bearers. He continues on in Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule. And we read this last week. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And here's what this comes down to as we read this. Again, we skip over it so many times. What God is telling us is not, here's all the jobs that I want you to do because I don't want to do them anymore. This isn't the Enuma Elish. This is not God creating mankind to walk around so that he doesn't have to do anything anymore. This is God saying, you as my image bearers are my partners. You are my partners in this. He could have continued on. He could have continued to do it all himself. He could have continued to raise man from dust and woman from ribs. He could have continued to, to grow all the crops himself. He could have continued to raise the animals all by himself. But he comes along and he creates these image bearers of his. And he says, you, you are my partners in this. I haven't spent a lot of my time, and, and maybe you have, maybe you haven't, thinking of myself as a partner of God. That in the work that I'm doing each and every day, in the job that I'm going to each and every day, now, yes, I am a pastor, and so, yes, I do think of a lot of what I do as being a partner of God, but I do other jobs too, and I've done other jobs. I just got done coaching middle school girls' soccer and in coaching middle school girls soccer, I sometimes had to remind myself that I am, in this moment, a partner of God. I'm not just going through the motions and doing some random job, but I'm fulfilling a command that he gave me, an invitation that he gave to me to be his partner, to be his image bearer. And whatever it is that you do, you have been invited, you have been commanded to be a partner with God, not his slave labor but his partner. Now, just to be clear, before we get too carried away with this, it is not an equal partnership. We are not ourselves gods walking around. He is still at the top, and he is still the one to be worshiped. But he has created us, and he has put us above the angels, and he has said, you are my image bearers. You are my partners in all of this. The word rule that he uses there, give you a little bit more Hebrew this morning, is rada. Say that with me, rada. Rada means to reign 
or to have dominion. And as he's talking to us through this, and as he's, as he's creating us, he's saying that you are going to have reign or dominion over the entire rest of the earth, that you are going to actively partner with me to take this world somewhere, to make something like we talked last week, to make something of this world that we have. And you can look throughout history, you can look throughout scriptural history, and you can see rulers who reigned really well. We can look throughout history and we can see those who have come along and they have created something beautiful and flourishing out of the world that we live in. They have, they have brought life to individuals all around them, but you can also look throughout history and including in scripture, including of God's own people themselves, and we see story after story after story of a ruler who came along and decided that I'm going to be about taking life instead of giving life. Instead of making something of the world, I'm going to take something from the world to make something of my life. And we see it page after page after page in scripture. We see it page after page in the books of history. And if I look at my life and I'm completely honest and I would assume, maybe unfairly, that if you look at your own life, you're gonna see some of it too that you see moments, and I see moments, where I ruled in a way that gave life to those around me. I ruled in a way, I, and when I mean rule, I don't mean I was in charge and I made all the decisions, but I, I had dominion and reign over the world that was around me and I did it in such a way that brought life to the world around me. Life to the world itself, life to the, the other image bearers that are around me that I've been called to bring life to, that I've been, I, I've been a ruler in the way that God asked me to be his ruler. I've been a partner of God in bringing life, but I can also look at plenty of moments where I've been the type of ruler that took life. Just looking at the world itself, I can look at moments where my choices have caused damage to the earth that he gave me dominion over. And I know that the debates rage over whether or not we should be going to clean energy or coal energy or, or oil or gas or all those things. This might be an unpopular opinion in this room, but I believe those are conversations that we should be having. I'm not saying that we need to switch how we do everything. I'm not making a political statement up here. I'm not saying that, that we need to follow the, the Green New Deal or the whatever other New Deal on the other side. I'm, I'm not saying any of that, but I'm saying I think we should be engaged in conversations about how we can best take care of the planet that God has given us dominion over rather than saying, no, God said we could do whatever we want with it. And so if we tear it apart and we burn it down, that's our choice, that's our prerogative. I've been in those conversations where like, nope, this is just how it is and we're gonna do how it is. I don't know what the best answer is to all of it, but I do believe that we should be in those conversations because God told us that we're supposed to rule over it to bring life to it, not to destroy it. But beyond that, I can look at decisions that I've made and the way that I have ruled or I have reigned or I've been a, a partner that didn't bring life to the human beings around me either. I was sharing with the youth over the past couple of weeks that, and I, and I hope that this doesn't come across as arrogant or anything or, or prideful, but I do feel like God has gifted me with the ability to use words. And I can, at moments, I can use those words and I can bring life to people. That's my prayer every single day. That's my prayer every time I stand up here on a Sunday, every time I enter into a conversation with one of you or anyone else that I run across. That was my prayer each and every day in practice with those girls is that my words would bring life. But I'm also pretty gifted at using my words to take life from people. I can, I can come up with some doozies when it comes to sarcastic responses and cutting responses, I can, I can give in to that temptation really fast to put you in your place, to take you back down to size, to remind you of just who you are. Oh man, the temptation is always right underneath the surface. What about you? 
What about you? Sometimes I rule in the way that God has asked me to rule, and other times I look at my history and I say, I, I, I have failed miserably at ruling in the way that God asked me to live, that God asked me to partner with him. In the jobs that I've held over the course of my life and the, the ministry positions that I've held over the course of my life, there have been successes and there have been failures. The approach that we take, the, the mindset that we have, and we talked about this a little bit last week, how we go into our jobs, whether or not our jobs are all about bringing life to me while, while robbing life of everyone else, or whether it's, it's bringing life to the world around us and the people around us. What we find to be the true purpose and the intent of creation in the first place affects how we approach those things. And it's also just like Mama used to always say, what you reap or what you sow is what you'll reap. That if your job and your life and your rule, your, your partnership is all about bringing life to yourself and the selfishness of I want more things, I want more comfort, then what you will sow is constant dissatisfaction. And always wanting just a little bit more, I can't quite get there. I don't have enough fame, I don't have enough prestige, I'm not getting the promotions that I want, I don't get paid enough, I will constantly be dissatisfied if everything that I do is about me. Or if I'm constantly going into it and it's all about getting what the other person has, then what I will sow is constant jealousy over what they have. And if I get it, then what I will sow is their jealousy towards what I have, which has now robbed them of life as well. What we sow is what we will reap. Our parents had it right when we were young. Young people in the room, your parents have it right. They're not on this part. I won't say on everything. Probably more than you think they do, though. I will throw that much out there. What you sow is what you're going to reap. How you approach your work, how you approach your retirement, how you approach your schooling, so much of it comes back to our belief about what we were created to do and be in the first place. So what about you? What about you? I've told you about me. What about you? Where has your life lined up? What is your primary motivation? I asked you this last week. What is your primary motivation behind going to work? What is your primary motivation behind going to school? What is your primary motivation behind raising your children? What is your primary motivation behind being a grandparent? What is your motivation behind being you? Do you recognize, do we recognize just how powerful of a thing it is that God said, I've created you as my representatives? I don't want all those other images. I want you to be my representative everywhere you go. Every time you log on to Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, you are my representative. Every time you tear somebody down or build somebody up, they're looking at you as my representative. Every time you ask that question that really has an underlying intent behind it, you're being my representative. tells us this is about more than just, just you and getting what you want. This is about bringing life to all that is around you. We have all failed. Every last one of us. I can say that with 100% certainty because I read it in the scriptures that I believe that we have all failed. All of us have at some point made life about myself, made my work about myself, made this about my comfort, my gain. All of us have done it, except for one. This is the part of the gospel that we tend to skip ahead to. 
We, we, we skip that beginning part and we skip to this part because we love to tell, and we should love to tell the part about how Jesus came. And Jesus came as a human, as one of us. Jesus came to set up his rule in this world, but to set up his rule in the way that God intended for it to be when he put Adam and Eve on the earth in the first place. That Jesus came to set up his rule and to set up his kingdom as a kingdom that will bring life to all, those, to all that are around it. To all of creation. Jesus set up his rule and set up his kingdom and gave us the example that, that we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others. That we put others ahead of us. That we even go to a cross when a cross is required to give of our lives for everyone around us. As you're sitting there, as I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, yeah, but this person did this, and I deserve this. Nobody deserved more good than Jesus. And yet he still went to the cross. He set up his rule, and he set up his kingdom And he showed us what this all meant back in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26 and in verse 28 where he says, I've created you in my image and I've created you to rule, to have dominion over the earth and to bring life, to make something of this world that you live in. And then we read the rest of the story. That Jesus rose again from the dead He ascended into heaven where he set up at the right hand of God. And he said, I'm going to re-extend the invitation to each and every one of you. You've all failed. You've all fallen short of the glory of what you were created to be in the first place and what you were created to do in the first place. And that sounds like such a harsh thing to say, except that it's absolutely true. He says, you've all failed, but I still want you to partner with me. I still want you to be my representative. I paid the price of what it takes to cover up your failure. Now I'm inviting you to come back in line and then step with me and to go into all the world and to be my representatives and to make something of this creation that I've put in place. Now you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, but, but I'm a teacher. I'm a medical worker. I'm a farmer. I'm a factory worker. I'm retired. I'm a student. How am I supposed to rule? How am I supposed to be his partner in whatever job it is that I'm fulfilling? You're supposed to do it by being human by being the image bearer that he created you to be each and every single day with the motivations that you have when you walk into it, with the interactions that you have with other people, with the interactions that you have in the world. See, you're not just earning a paycheck and you're not just collecting a pension. You're not just earning a grade you're fulfilling the call to be human. You're fulfilling the call to be his representative each and every single day. And I get it, some of us don't like our jobs. Some of us find it really hard to get motivated. Whether it's, you're get, it's hard to get motivated to go into school in the morning or whether it's hard to get motivated to go to practice, it's hard to get motivated to go to, go to the office or out to the field, it's hard to get motivated because you're retired and you, you don't have a list of this is what you have to do every day. It's hard to get motivated. I get it. For some of us, it's harder than others. For some of us, we're more miserable where we are than others. Ruling isn't easy. I would imagine that any ruler that has ever walked on the face of the planet that you could go up to them and say, hey, is your job easy? And say, no. Decision after decision every single day that's difficult to make. People push back on everything that I do. People ignore me. People fight with me. People tell me I'm a failure every single day. 
And there are moments where I wake up and I don't want to do it. Or there are days I wake up and I don't want to do it. Church, ruling isn't easy. But it's what we were created to do. Each and every single one of us in here. You may not make the decisions at your job. You may not be at the, the top of the food chain, the boss. Students, you're going to school, you've got teachers. And you've got to listen to your teachers. You don't get to tell the teacher what you're doing that day. But how you respond, how we go into our work, the effort that we show, the way that we step into and in line with our creator as an artist, as an engineer, as a teacher, as a horticulturist, as a zoologist, as a musician, we're stepping into the art of being human and being what he's created us to be. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then he blessed them, and he said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and rule it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. And then God looked over all that he had made and he saw that it was very good. And God rested, and he delighted in his creation. He delighted in the partnership that he created with his image bearers. Each and every day, we join him as his image bearers to rule and to reign.